Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We have a special text this morning, that's for sure. And I hate to say that, you know, to single out one passage of Scripture, particularly in light of the very thing that our uh, passage states that Paul wrote here, all Scripture is inspired. That being the case, it's all profitable, all special, all important. But this text certainly is fundamental to that very important text that we understand what Paul is saying and the import that it has for us daily in our lives. So we have two verses, but it's a very important two verses. Verse 16 and 17 of 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be equal adequate, equipped for every good work. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study in it. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, it is a great blessing, great privilege to be with your people on a Lord's Day such as this and doing what we do every Sunday morning, and that's open our Bibles, read a passage, and then spend the hour considering its meaning and its application. And we are reminded here of that great privilege because what we do when we open the Bible is we open a unique book, Your Word. And what a privilege that is to possess the Word of the infinite Almighty God who has spoken over the ages, and it's all contained in this book, and it's reliable for faith and practice, as Paul explains. So we thank you for this great gift that you have given to us, and we pray that as we consider it, we study it, we think about what this is this revelation we have, we pray that you would impress upon us the necessity of being students of the scriptures, studying them regularly, daily, in order that we would be changed, that our souls would be nourished and we would become increasingly like Christ and we would be adequate, equipped for every good work and be a blessing to those around us. So bless us, Lord, teach us. May the Spirit of God illuminate our minds, give us an understanding of the passage we have read, how it applies to us, and then uh, guide and direct us and enable us to act upon that. We Thank you for your goodness in all areas of life. We are debtors to you, uh, debtors to mercy alone in all things, spiritually and materially. Every breath of life that we take is a gift from you. And so we look to you for that, for everything. And you are a faithful God, a good and gracious God, a giver of great gifts and abundant gifts. Help us to understand that about you, that you are a God of unconditional love. We thank you for that. And may our knowledge of that and what we learn from your inspired word is that you are reliable and gracious and good, and we should love you all the more and desire to serve you faithfully as a result of that. Well, may that be the result of our time together this morning. Bless us, build us up in the faith, encourage us, encourage us with the, the knowledge that we possess this great repository of your revelation in the Bible. And may we use it. Thank you for Christ and his death for us, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. In 1536, William Tyndale was executed for the crime of translating the New Testament into English. He was an impressive man. He spoke seven languages, he was educated at Oxford and Cambridge, and devoted his life and learning to giving the English people a Bible that, as he said, even a plowboy 
could understand. For that, he became an exile from his homeland, a fugitive who was hunted across Europe and finally captured and put in a cold, gloomy jail outside of Brussels. The only surviving letter in his own hand was written to the governor of the prison requesting some of his possessions. He asked for some warm clothes, a cap and a coat since the cloak he had was very thin. He asked for a lamp because it was lonely sitting in the dark. But above all, he requested his Hebrew Bible, Hebrew grammar, and Hebrew dictionary so that he could spend his time in that study. Now, why would a man with such gift, such ability and opportunity, risk his life and give his life to study the Bible and desire to have that book more than food and clothing? Well, Paul gives the answer in 2 Timothy 3. In verse 15, he states that the sacred writings are able to give the wisdom that leads to salvation. In verse 16, he states that all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable. There is no book in the whole world that can do that. No book like the Bible. It is from God and it gives life. For that reason, William Tyndale and John Wycliffe before him devoted their lives to the study and translation of the Bible. It is necessary for the Christian's existence and welfare. Paul makes that clear in his classic statement on the origin and purpose of Scripture in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, where he shows how fully Scripture meets every need for the believer. Its source is God. And because of that, the Scriptures are infallibly useful for the believer. That is Paul's meaning in 2 Timothy 3.16, if, if the correct translation is all Scripture is inspired by God. I say if because it is possible to translate the verse in a way that changes the meaning significantly. In fact, at least there are translations that do that. The Revised Standard Version of the Bible renders it every Scripture... I should say the revised version of the Bible renders it, every scripture inspired of God is also profitable. The New English Bible translates it in a similar way. Every inspired scripture has its use. In which case, instead of stating two facts about the scriptures, Paul would be making one statement, which is that inspired scripture is useful. The result, though, is a translation that limits the Bible in two ways. First of all, it suggests that not all Scripture is inspired, and therefore not all Scripture is profitable. Only the inspired parts are. There's a problem with that. First of all, it introduces an idea that is foreign to the Bible. Nowhere does the Bible indicate that inspiration is limited to select passages. Uh, second, it seems to me, at least, it states the obvious. It goes without saying, doesn't it, that inspired Scripture is useful? Uh, Timothy didn't need to be told that, but if that is the case, then you have the problem of knowing, well, which ones are inspired and which ones aren't. How do we know the difference? How do we determine that? It's very subjective. In fact, it's impossible to make those distinctions. More importantly, the translation doesn't do justice to that little word, and, which in the Greek text connects the two words, inspired and profitable. It indicates that Paul is making two statements about Scripture, not just one. So the translation that best suits the context and the grammar is, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable. The Greek text is very clear. It simply is all Scripture inspired. We supply that is, but that's the meaning. All Scripture is inspired by God and 
is profitable. The scripture that Paul is referring to here is probably the Old Testament, since he has already referred to it in verse 15 with mention of the sacred writings. Timothy was taught in his youth, those would be the Old Testament that he was taught by his Jewish mother and Jewish grandmother. It may be Paul intended the apostolic writings in this, that he used the word scripture in verse 16 to distinguish it from the sacred writings in verse 15 to state that all scripture, both Old and New Testaments, are inspired. But since the word scripture is used, I think, some 50 times in the New Testament, and almost always of the Old Testament, that is probably his meaning here. He's probably speaking of the Old Testament. Nevertheless, everything that Paul says of the Old Testament would apply in principle to the New Testament. And Paul considered his own writings to be scripture. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and verse 13, he writes that the things he speaks are not in words taught by human wisdom, but those taught by the Spirit. Now, he didn't say his ideas came from God, but that the very words that he wrote were given to him by God. They were taught by the Holy Spirit. The same is true of Peter. He, too, considered his writings and the writings of Paul to be Scripture. In 2 Peter 3, verse 16, he refers to Paul's letters and those who distort them. And he's referring there to the, the false teachers, the heretics that he was uh, countering there in the book of 2 Peter. And he says that they distort them as they do the rest of Scripture. Well, that includes Paul's writings. His writings and the rest of Scripture refers to the whole canon of Scripture and puts Paul's writings within that. And so Paul's statements here in 2 Timothy 3 would apply to his letters and to all of the New Testament. All Scripture, both Old and New Testaments, is inspired by God. The great B.B. Warfield, Benjamin B. Warfield, uh, Princeton theologian, said inspiration is the fundamental quality of the Scriptures. But that word can be misleading. The word inspiration means that which is breathed in. And it comes to us from the Latin, and it's used here in the Vulgate, the Latin translation of the Bible, inspirata. I don't criticize that word. It's a good word. But it can be misunderstood to imply that God breathed something divine into a body of human writings that already existed to make them scriptures. In other words, the writers wrote their words, Isaiah, David, prophecies, the Psalms, and God breathed something into them, inspired those writings. That's not what Paul means. Literally, the word translated inspired by God is God breathed. The form of the Greek word indicates that it has a passive meaning. So that the idea is that Scripture is breathed out by God. That is different from what we normally mean by the word inspired or what we think of. We often use that word uh, in the sense of a, a, a powerful impulse that a, an artist or poet has. We might say that Beethoven was inspired when he wrote the Sixth Symphony, the Pastoral Symphony, and, and mean that he was so overcome by and filled with this gift of music that he had that he produced a great masterpiece. Or people will, will say that a speech inspired them, or they were inspired by some work of art or architecture, and they mean their, their spirit was lifted. They were encouraged. They were motivated. Maybe they want to be an architect now or an artist because of what they saw. That's not the idea of Paul's statement here. He doesn't mean that, that God breathed into human writings or God somehow motivated the writers, encouraged them to write beautiful literature. He means that Scripture was breathed out by God. 
But that occurred in connection with human authors so that what they wrote ultimately were not their words. They were God's words, our God's words. But Paul doesn't explain how that happened. He doesn't explain the mechanics of it. just states that it's a fact. I think Peter comes closer to doing that in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, where he writes that men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Now, the word translated moved is a very common word in Greek. It's used by Luke twice in a significant way in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, verse 2, to describe the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost as the rush of a mighty wind or moving of a mighty wind. Well, a mighty wind doesn't just move, it rushes, and so that's a good translation of it. But the idea is move or moving. And he uses it again later in Acts 27, a passage about Paul being moved to Rome across the Mediterranean in this ship, and they become caught in a, in a storm. Paul warned the captain not to do it, but they went ahead and the storm came up, and for two weeks they're in this storm. And in both verses 15 and 17, Luke wrote that the ship on the Mediterranean Sea was being driven by the wind. And Peter's meaning is similar. Like a ship, born by the wind that, that fills its sails. The writers of Scripture were born along in their writing by the Holy Spirit, so that the Spirit produced what He intended to be recorded. Just as the wind will blow a ship a certain direction, the Spirit of God was directing them in certain ways. The authors were supernaturally guided by the Holy Spirit. Not in some mechanical way, and we shouldn't think of it that way, as these writers of Scripture were like secretaries just taking dictation. Every word came and they just wrote the words in a mechanical fashion. God did it in such a way that the individuality and personality of each human writer was preserved. His style was preserved. His use of words, his theology was all uh, preserved. And, and all of that was raised to a very high level of activity. God equipped each of the writers with different abilities different personalities, different levels of education, different experiences, and all of that came out in, in their writing so that he guided their memories and he used all of these things in their life to produce the Bible. And he produced it in such a way that it, it is free from human error. And so we speak of the inerrancy of Scripture and its original autographs, meaning the original writings were without error. So when Paul wrote Romans or John wrote the Gospel of John, there was no error in it. Now as scribes down through the years transmitted these texts, there would be an occasional word that they got wrong and uh, uh, maybe it was the word God instead of Christ or something like that. But not one mistake that can be recover, uh, uncovered it affects any doctrine in any way. They're all minor uh, differences. But the writings that were originally written were preserved completely from that. We can speak of the inerrancy of Scripture. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16... Paul's not giving that explanation. He's not giving us a full explanation of inspiration. He is simply stating the fact of it, that all Scripture is the very Word of God. And he used an unusual word to do it. This word, God breathed, it is used only this one time in the Bible. But Paul chose it to impress on Timothy that what he was being asked to do, to put his full confidence in, was not the invention of men, but writings that were actually breathed out by God. Remember, Timothy is in a difficult time, in a difficult place. 
There's unfaithfulness everywhere. People are turning away from the truth. There's error everywhere. And it's a difficult thing to stand for the truth. And what Paul is about to do in a few moments in chapter 4, verse 2, is give him this great exhortation, this command. Preach the word against all the opposition. Preach the word. And certainly it is an encouragement to know that the word that he preaches is the very word of God. God breathed. Well, the word is used only this one time by Paul, but it's not an idea that is unique to Paul. In fact, it has its basis in Scripture. I'll give a few examples. Isaiah 55, great chapter of that book. It follows Isaiah 53 and the promise of the servant and the salvation that he will accomplish and the forgiveness of sins that he will achieve as our substitute. And then you begin this chapter 15 with this invitation to come to the waters. Come and buy without money, wine, and, and, and uh, it, it's this invitation to come and believe. And then he, Isaiah speaks of the Word of God, and, and in this, God the Lord speaks and compares His Word to a fruitful rain. There's no, this would certainly be uh, to us as well, but certainly to the Israel, the, the uh, the Israelites, the, the rain is so vitally important to their land because without it, the land's not fruitful. They depended upon the rain, as every farmer and uh, every agrarian society does. But there, the Lord is saying His Word is like the rain that produces fruit. And then He says in verse 11, So will my Word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty. The word goes forth from his mouth. In Matthew 4, verse 4, Christ said, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The Bible comes from God. The claim it makes for itself is that it is God-breathed. It's not the invention of men. Its words and sentences have been breathed out by God. So we can truthfully call the Bible the Word of God. That's what it is. Some parts, of course, are challenging to our interest. Parts like uh, genealogies. If you read chapter after chapter of genealogy, you're eyes begin to glaze over. That's true for, I think, all of us. And there are some passages that are just very puzzling, not only for a plowboy, but for all of us. Still, it is the greatest treasure in the world. The Bible, the Word of God. It answers the great questions. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? Scripture is light. It makes known the mysteries of life. It, it reveals God. It explains the past. It informs the present. It reveals the future. Why would we ever find ourselves uninterested in that? But most importantly, the Bible is revelation with a purpose, which is not to satisfy man's curiosity, but to remedy his condition to show us the way of salvation and life. Paul says it is profitable. That is the main point that he is making to Timothy. It is useful. That almost sounds like an understatement. It's useful, it's profitable, it, 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 it is essential. Without it we are lost and ruined. Scripture is God's means for producing change in people. First with conversion and then with sanctification, with transformation. And we should never underestimate its power to do that. In Jeremiah 23, verse 29, God said, Is not my word like fire and like a hammer that shatters a rock? That's the word of God. In other words, God's word is effective. It is powerful. It produces change like fire and hammers. And that kind of power is necessary. It's necessary 
The heart of man is by nature hard as stone. And that's not my description. That comes out of Ezekiel 36, verse 26. It is insensitive naturally to the things of God. It is dead as a rock. And only the Bible is sufficient to change that. It is God's hammer. It breaks the heart. It softens it. It makes it receptive. In fact, it makes it new. It em empowers us a dead sinner with a rock-hard heart imparts life to it. That's how Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 speaks of it. It carries with it, the Word of God carries with it the seed of life, and, and it imparts that to the hearer through the preaching of God's Word, through the reading of God's Word, but through that we become new creatures. And through its instruction, we are nourished in our souls. Our, our heart of stone being removed, our heart of flesh is, is taught, it is nourished, and we're transformed. And there's no change apart from that. No change apart from the Word of God. No wonder Satan is against it. And throughout history, he has tried to destroy it or tried to undermine its authority. He does that with all of the doctrines of Scripture, and each generation will have its particular doctrinal battle to fight, but the battle for the Bible is perennial. Every generation will fight it. A recent attack was reviewed Wednesday in the Wall Street Journal. Some of you may have read it. I know in the first service, people commented on the article that they had read. It's a, a new book titled A History of the Bible by an Anglican priest, John Barton, who is a professor emeritus at Oxford University. So this is a scholarly book. But in it, he questions the historicity of the events. It's the history of the Bible, but he doesn't believe there's a lot of history in it. Uh, he states that most scholars do not have any consensus on the historicity of the various events in the Old Testament. He speaks of the gospel, uh, the gospels as being a, a second century compilation of rumors and exaggerated tales about Jesus. Uh, the books ascribed to the Apostle Paul, most of them were not written by Paul, if any of them were. In other words, the Bible isn't true. Uh, the writer, the reviewer rather, Barton Swain, who professes to be a believer, wrote that as he read the book, I kept wondering if Mr. Barton thinks there is any point in actually reading the Bible. I reached the last page and wondered, and, and wondered still. Well, he then, the, the reviewer, Mr. Swain, uh, exposes the problem here. He understood the reason for the writer's skepticism toward Scripture. He wrote, the trouble with the author's method is its rock-solid, unthinking presupposition against the possibility of the supernatural. Now, presupposition is the starting point. We begin with our presupposition. It's a, a choice of faith. And we begin either believing that either believing in divine revelation or in, in human reason. And this man is clearly anti-supernatural in his thinking. He's a naturalist, a materialist. And when you're a naturalist and a materialist, that's how you begin and that's how you view everything. Well, when you see something about the supernatural, you discount it. It can't be true because the universe is not like that. The whole world and the universe is, is not about miracles, it's about laws and principles of nature, and so you look at this book, which is about God Almighty and His works, His supernatural activity from beginning to end, and it's not going to make sense to a man who's a naturalist, a materialist, who doesn't believe any of that. It's, it's the natural man. The natural man writing about the Bible produces a book like that, and that's what we're taught in the Scriptures. There's nothing new about that. That's 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14. These things are foolish to the natural man. But that's the attack, and that's who the attack comes from. And the attack 
goes on. And there's a good reason for this ongoing constant attack on the Word of God. It's God's revelation and our standard. Without it, the church loses its effectiveness and loses its way. It will be like a ship without a compass, adrift at sea. And so the devil is always trying to destroy it. And if he cannot break God's hammer, and he can't, then his goal is to have it slip from our hand. To persuade us that the Bible alone is not sufficient. Well, when Christians believe that, when they stop believing in the sufficiency of Scripture, then they begin to adopt other ways, human ways, worldly methods, and they lose their unique power and direction. The Bible is sufficient. That is the point Paul is making to Timothy. He has explained that all Scripture is breathed out by God in order to say that it is profitable. So Timothy, preach the Word, he'll say. And it's profitable, it's useful in many ways. Paul gives four ways for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Those four words are divided into two pairs. The first relates to doctrine, the second relates to practice. So in this description of Scripture's usefulness, Paul begins, you know, rather brings together both creed and conduct. The scriptures are sufficient for both for faith and practice. First of all, they're profitable for teaching. That's where Paul always begins. That's where the apostles begin. With knowledge, with doctrine. That, that is where we must begin. Knowledge is basic to everything else. We need to, to study it all. We need to study the whole of the Bible, not just certain books of it, not just the Psalms and the Proverbs. We need to study them, of course, but not just them, not just the Gospels. We need to study all 66 books of the Bible, both the Old and the New Testaments. That is how we get the full range of God's revelation, how we get all of His doctrine, and, and, and there are many doctrines. But I think Calvin gave a good summary of, of it, of what we get in the first sentence of his Institutes of the Christian Religion. It's a great statement, very simple statement. But very often it's the simple statements that are the most profound statements. But he wrote, nearly all the wisdom we possess, that is to say true and sound wisdom, consists of two parts, the knowledge of God and of ourselves. That's what the Bible gives. It reveals that God is. That's how the Bible begins. In the beginning, God. Well, Moses, aren't you going to try to lay a foundation and prove? No, I don't need to prove it. In the beginning, God. We begin there. You have to begin with that. So he begins with God. God is. And then the Bible explains the kind of God that he is. He's a just God, it's true, but he's a loving God. A kind and merciful God. A father to, those, to his people. Um, and, and then we learn about ourselves, what kind of beings we are. We are creatures. We're God's creatures, and therefore we're responsible to Him. That is where wisdom begins, with the fear of God. And when e even the, the simplest plowboy has that, has that knowledge, he's wiser than the greatest philosopher, scholar, or king, because with Scripture... With the whole counsel of God, there is not only wisdom, but reproof. Error is exposed and disproved. Scripture alone is the standard. It reveals truth, and it exposes false ideas. So, with the teaching and reproof of Scripture... Pure doctrine is produced in the saint and in the church. Without that, the church will fall into error. It's very interesting. I just thought about this today as I was going over this. To read the letters of the apostles, 
And almost all of them, in one way or another, if not directly, indirectly, they're dealing with error. We're barely out of the first century. The church has barely been established. And it's dealing with error constantly. The first letter that Paul wrote, the book of Galatians, was written to these young churches. He no, he no sooner gets back to Antioch than he's got to write a letter to correct the error that's been in, in, in invested into that church by these false teachers, these Judaizers. And so it goes. The church of the first century was continually bombarded and, and attacked by error. And it's no different today. So without the Word of God to counter that and to direct us, we will fall into error. The second pair of words has to do with Christian conduct. Paul says that all Scripture is profitable for correction and for training. The root idea of this word correction is making something straight, restoring something. Something that becomes crooked is made straight. That, that's the negative side of Scripture's use. It straightens things out. It corrects things. The positive, positively, it gives... Uh, Training in righteousness. God's Word teaches us how to live. In the words of Psalm 119, verse 105, that tells you how long that psalm is. If you want to read about the Word of God, that's the psalm to read. That's a great chapter in the book of Psalms. I say chapter because it's, it's like a chapter in the Bible. Psalm 119, verse 105 states that it is a lamp to our feet and it is a light to our path. Scripture is essential for every area of our lives, for both doctrine and duty. We're in the dark if we don't have it. So first of all, it tells us about God and then it tells us about ourselves. It tells us how we're to live for God. And if, if Scripture is used in all these ways, then it fulfills the purpose given in verse 17 that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Makes us adequate. It equips us. People often ask for sermons that are practical, which often means something uh, non-doctrinal. Oh, we have to study more doctrine to think about this and get into the doctrine of the Trinity that is so hard to comprehend. Yeah, it, it's, it's difficult, but yes, that's what we need to do. And people will say, that's not practical. Let's, let's get something else if, uh, that, that will if fix immediate problems or help us avoid certain problems. So preaching in churches today is often to what are called felt needs, topics on anything from parenting to personal finances, uh, counseling of some kind, in, in order to be relevant. Now, I think it's important to be relevant and to address all of the problems and issues of life. But Paul makes it clear what the Christian needs, and it is the Scriptures, the truth of the Word of God, the doctrines of the Word of God and all that comes out of it. That is relevant. That gives the foundation that enables the saint to withstand the storms of life, and, and all of us will go through storms at some point. And as the Scriptures are taught, subjects like parenting and finances and all those issues, they do come up. They are to be dealt with. They, they are, they're, they're subjects that we should teach. But as we teach through the Word of God, we do teach those things and, and address all the issues that need to be addressed. But more importantly, people, as, we, as they go through the Word of God, will be grounded in the truth of God, the truth about God. They will learn who God is, the kind of God that He is, and in doing that, grow in their relationship with Him. That alone is the cure of a lot of problems. That is what we're created for. Knowing God, that's what Jesus said in John 17, verse 3, eternal life is knowing God, knowing Him and the one whom He sent, Jesus Christ. 
It's having a relationship with him. And as we learn of him, as he really is, we will want to know him more and we will want to please him and live an orderly and godly life. There is nothing more practical than that, than laying a firm foundation for life. In fact, the practicality of Scripture, the sufficiency of Scripture for our every need is illustrated from an ancient papyrus, an ancient text in which this word equipped is found. It's used in regard to a boat that was being ordered, that was to be supplied or equipped with two oars. In a a boat, there are a few things more practical than being supplied with two oars. If a boat is equipped with only one oar when it needs two, then it'll only go in a circle. But for it to be steered straight, rowed in the right course, the boatman needs two oars. Well, that's what the Bible does for us. It equips us adequately as nothing else can. It, It gives us the knowledge of God and of man and how to live in relationship to both and how to stand firm in the storms of life. And Paul was teaching Timothy this, to encourage him in a hard time when people were faithless and error was spreading. Timothy was to continue in the things that he had learned. That's what Paul told him earlier in verse 14. He was to minister the Scriptures. They are useful. They are useful against heresy. They are useful useful to, to refute error. They expose error and they smash it as with a hammer. It's God's means of building up His people. There's no other way for us to grow into the image of Christ to be like Him than through the Scriptures. There's no Christian maturity apart from the study of Scripture. The assurance Paul gives Timothy here is that as he ministers the word faithfully, the people will grow. They will become adequate, equipped for every good work. They will be a blessing to others, and in being a blessing to others, they'll bring glory to God. But the Scriptures would also be a blessing to Timothy, to himself personally. They would strengthen him in times of difficulty and persecution, which we must suffer if we desire to live godly lives. Paul has told us that, told Timothy that. The Scriptures can do that because they are not like any other writings. They are the sacred writings. They have been breathed out by God. They're what we need. As Jesus said in Matthew 4, verse 4, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The Scriptures were the Lord's food. The Scriptures are our food. But today there's a famine in the land, a famine like the one the Lord spoke of in the book of Amos. In Amos chapter 8, verse 11, He said, Behold, days are coming when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. That's the worst famine. When we are without spiritual food, the results are devastating, deadly. Hosea said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We ignore the Scriptures at our peril. When we do, we build a foundation of sand that nothing can stand on. William Tyndale understood that. That was the reason he was willing to sacrifice his life for the Scriptures. He understood their nature and value that they are the very Word of God. And he saw his countrymen uh, starving spiritually and knew that the only remedy was the Scriptures. And when he sat shivering in a cold, dark jail, lonely, facing death, he knew that they were the only thing that would give him comfort and sustain him. It's the only thing that can do that. 
So we are to put our confidence in the Bible. Believe it and follow it. It's the very Word of God, written and accessible to us. To say we're trusting in the Word of God means we're trusting in God because this is His Word. He has spoken, and we take His Word at face value, and we delve into it, and we learn about it. To believe the Word of God is to believe God. To trust the Word of God is to trust God. That's what we need to do. And as I said, it's accessible to us. People, though, often seek other things, seek their encouragement and hope in other things and places. Immanuel Kant was like that. He was one of the great minds of the 18th century. He posed three questions. What can I know? What ought I do? What may I hope? Well, he tried to find the answers to those questions in philosophy rather than scripture, in reason rather than revelation. But only the Bible has the answers. Paul said it, it gives wisdom that leads to salvation. What can I know? We can know God. What ought I do? We ought to glorify God. What may I hope? I may hope in life everlasting, the resurrection to come and glory forever. That's what everyone who believes in Jesus Christ can know and do and hope and have. Have you believed in Jesus Christ? He is God's eternal Son who became a man in order to die for sinners, to bear the penalty of their sin in their place. He has done that. And He's done that and finished the work completely so that all who believe in Him, whoever they may be, rich or poor, self-righteous, reprobate sinner, whoever they may be, they will be saved, they will be received, and they will receive eternal life and forgiveness forever. That's the testimony of Scripture. That's what it teaches. It makes wise unto salvation, and throughout the Word of God, that great hope is given. So, look to Christ. Believe in Him. Receive from Him forgiveness. Receive from Him eternal life. And then apply yourself to the Word of God so that you will be equipped for every good work to bring glory to God and blessing to those around us. May God help us all to do that. Let's end with one of the great hymns of our uh, song of praise book, hymn number 11, A Debtor to Mercy Alone, and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 11. confess we are debtors to mercy alone that your mercy is great and we thank you for it through it we have life you sent your son to die in our place and in dying for us save us for you and for all eternity we give you praise and thanks for him and it's in his name we pray amen